Hello and welcome again to another tutorial in Wildlife. This time we're going to be looking at the animation editor which has been released in the April 2024 update. This animation editor will allow you to animate movement, rotation, options of props and even control the event system using it. So let's jump right in. Let's open edit mode using tab and in the automation tab all the way at the end you'll see the animation sequence. Let's drag one into the scene. Uh, you can have multiple of these, but of course you need to make sure that they don't interfere with each other. Like, for example, if two of them control one object's position and they're both running at the same time, the object cannot be sure which one to use, so keep that in mind. And now that we have one, let's open the animation editor. And you can see this new screen appear. To change the playback position, you left mouse click drag up here to change the playback cursor. You can use the right mouse button to drag the view around and you can use control scroll to change the range of uh, time you can see up here. If we zoom in a little you'll be able to see that the playback cursor sort of snaps to these intervals. By default the sample rate is set to 32 meaning 32 samples per second. You can turn it off or change it. Turning it off will just make it completely smooth but I recommend having it on while editing because then it's easier to get to existing keyframes and editing them. Then let's shift our attention to these buttons down here. They're pretty standard for most uh, players, except some of them. This one, for example, sets the current location of the playback position as the end of the animation. So if we click this, you can see this becomes black, meaning that that's the end of the animation. Then, well, these are the go to end, go to start, play forwards, play backwards, pretty standard stuff. These will just go to the last and first keyframe of the animation. And this button defines whether the animation should loop or not. So if we turn it on and I play it here, it will wrap to the start. Similarly, if I go backwards, it will also wrap to the end. All right, let's start animating something. I will put this uh, somewhere where it's not in the way. You can open it in a separate window. So if you have multiple monitors, you could just put it on a different monitor. But for the purposes of this video, I will keep it in the game view. Let's add a cube to the scene. If we want to animate this, we need to add an object track for it in the animation editor. We can do that by having it selected and clicking the plus object button. And then you can see a new object track has appeared. You can delete object tracks by right clicking and deleting them this way again. Also just a small useful information. If nothing is selected, you can click on the label of this object to select it in the outliner. By itself, the animation tracks don't do anything. We need to tell them which values we want to animate. So we press on the track button. We'll have a few options here. We always have the transform option, so position, rotation, scale. And these are usually um, depending on what kind of object it is. For example, we have specular, roughness, metallic, texture tiling. They're all float numbers or numbers with um, digits after the comma. So we can see those four are there. Um, material type is an integer. I mean, it's a drop down, but you can see it as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And of course, we have all the rest. We have colors, we have Boolean strings. Everything that's in here will show up in here and can be animated. So let's go ahead and add the position as a track. Um, if you click on the label or anywhere here, it will automatically close that menu. But if you use these buttons, it'll keep it open for you to add multiple. And again, you can delete them again by right clicking and selecting delete. As you can see, after we added the position track, it actually added three tracks, one for X, Y, and Z. They are bundled together. You can't just have one of them unless you don't put any keyframes in it, but it'll still be here. And you can also see three keyframes have been added by default. They'll just have the value of the current position. So it just makes it easier to just have a starting point. So let's scrub to second four, let's say and move the cube where we want to have it at second four. Let's just put it over here. And then click this button to add a keyframe to all of the position subtracks. You can also click these separately, but this just makes it easier to add it to all of them. And now if I scrub through this, you can see the cube will move from its initial position, which was with these three keyframes, to the new position we just set. If you ever get into the situation where you already moved your cube to where you want to have a keyframe, but the animation isn't where you want the keyframe, um, you'll think, oh, well, that's annoying. Now if I scrub here, it'll update the animation and if my changes are gone. But if it happens, there is a way of um, 
getting around it, and that is by using middle mouse button to scrub, which will change the playback position, but not actually update the animation. And then you can just add it here, and now you have another keyframe. Let's just for fun also add another truck. Let's take the color, for example. And by default, it'll have the color that is here. Um, you have two ways of changing this, so let, let me just go to the end. Uh, you can either change it directly in here and then click the track button, which will then go from white to red. Or alternatively, let me just undo that, you can change it directly in here. As soon as any of these values change, they will automatically create a keyframe at the location. So if I make this green, you can see all of the tracks got a uh, keyframe. It'll blend to green. And let's put another one back here, make it red. And now it'll go to green, to white, or the other way around. If instead of color you actually wanted to do to a mission, but you already had a lot of keyframes, so you don't want to redo all of that work, you have the option to right click this and say replace with, it will find everything else that is a color, and then just click on emission. Now it'll change the emission value instead, instead of the color. Or you can right click and duplicate to emission, which will just create the emission and have the same keyframes again. This is also not exclusive to tracks. You can also replace the object it references. So if we add another cube, for example, and uh, I want to want this animation to be on this one instead, I could just select it, right click on this cube and retarget it to it, which would mean that this cube is now the one that is targeted. Or, uh, you probably saw it, you can duplicate it to that one as well. Now both of them will have it. Well. They are both in the same location, but both of them have the same animation now. For the keyframes, you can just click them to the select them. You can shift click to select multiple, then you can drag them around. And of course you can also copy them. So control C and then go to where you want to paste them, control V. Now it'll remain in that location for a while because that's the same location. You can also box select. So if I just drag a box here, you'll see I'll select all of these, which will also create these handles left and right, which help me resize these. So let me just select multiple so it's more apparent. It'll just scale them according to the, the scale box itself. And that's about it for the keyframes in the track view. Let me just uh, delete these. So I select them, press delete, so that it's easier to work with for now. Um, because I want to show you something. If I play forwards, you may be able to see that the cube sort of speeds up and slows down at the end. Um, this is its interpolation mode, and to change that, we need to head over to the curve view. Before I continue the animation, I'll just talk about how to navigate this view too. Let me just make it a little bit larger. You hold right click again to move it around. You still have the time value on the x axis and the value axis here on the y. Um, you hold control to squash and um, stretch it on the time axis again and you hold alt and scroll to only do it on the value axis and scrolling normally does both at the same time. Now it's already telling us that we don't have any track selected we want to display. Um, to do display one we just need to click on it. We can also uh, display multiple at the same time by holding control and clicking another or you can also hold shift and just range select. You can also um, select all of the tracks in a group by clicking on the label of the group or double clicking on one of them inside. You can already see the curves are here. Um, you could just uh, use the control and alt scrolling to get them into view, but there are actually buttons that help you do this. So if you click this button, it'll try to fit them all to the current screen. These two do the same, except one does it only vertically and one does it only horizontally. And just for completion, this one just um, goes to where the cursor is, which can be handy if you lost it and don't want to put it, uh, place it somewhere else. You can also press F to fit the curves into the view and only the selected ones. Um, except F also has the added functionality that it will only focus the selected keyframes. Like, for example, if I only select these two and press F, it will only fit these two to the screen. But if nothing is selected, it will have the same functionality as this button. Like in the track view, you already saw just now, you can also box select. You can click select and hold shift or control to select multiple. And you have these resize handles again, except you also have them top and bottom now, so you could just scale this. You can see it's already moving up here, but you can scale it on both axes if you need to 
extend the range or the, how long it'll take to do it. Okay, but let's go back to the animation. I already showed you that the cube sort of speeds up and slows down at the end again. And that's because of how the curve is set up. We're only moving it on Y, so let's only focus on Y, press F. And you can see it, it starts flat, gets steeper and goes back to being flat. And that is exactly what defines this motion. So wherever the curve is at a given time, that's the value it'll have. So you can see if I go to second one, it already shows me it should be at negative 1416 and it is. Um, so if this was perfectly straight instead, that would mean this would move perfectly at a constant speed. So let's just try that. I'll point this to that keyframe and point this one to this keyframe. These things are called tangents, by the way. They define how the curve is shaped. But if I play it now, you can see this thing doesn't slow down anymore. It's perfectly constant all the time. We could also undo this for now. And if I double click anywhere on the curve, it'll automatically create another keyframe there with the tang tangent that will fit this. And I could make it even steeper if I wanted to, which would mean that it uh, speeds up much more and slows down way more. Or I could even go even further and turn it too far so that it overshoots it a little, which gives it this cool motion where it sort of, it looks a bit bouncy. So you can use this to give your animation a bit of character or just change it in a way that suits your animation. Now this isn't the only thing we can do with keyframes. There's actually a lot we can do with them. If you right click a keyframe while it's selected, also works with multi-selection, you also have different options on how it should actually function. Like, let's just go through them. Auto will just um, automatically rotate it towards the next two points to make it somewhat smooth automatically. Smooth uh, is basically the same thing, except it doesn't auto-rotate, it just stays the way it is. But uh, these two sides are still linked, so if you put this one down, that one will go up. Um, unlike broken, if you select broken, both of them are individual. So you can see now the animation also has this hard cut on that location, because it just jumps into the different direction immediately. Then we can also change the tangent type for the left and right tangents individually. You can either press this button to only change the right one, or this one only the left one, or you can click in the middle to change both at the same time. Free is what we just had. You can just rotate it how you want and it'll make a smooth curve out of it. Linear makes the tangent point directly to the next, well, point. So if I put it over here, you can see it just points directly at that, which also means if I select this one and select linear for the left side, these will always point directly at each other, making this a perfectly straight line, uh, no matter where you put it. And then we still have constant, which just keeps the value on the same level until the next keyframe is hit. So you can also move this, you can see it, it'll just stay here until the next keyframe is hit. Now let's look at these two values up here. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, they just show whichever value you have currently selected. But you can also select multiple keyframes at once and change one of these values. Like if I change this to 2, all of them will jump to 2. Or I could even say the value should be, well, say 2000. And all of them will go to value 2000. This will probably, yeah, it'll just fly somewhere. But uh, at this position, then it'll be at 2000, 2000, 2000. Let's just have a quick look at what options we also have. Um, we have float default mode and type that uh, refers to these modes again. If we, for example, change um, this to broken instead, if I now add a keyframe, it'll automatically be broken already. Same goes with the type. So if I change the default float type to constant, you'll see if I add a keyframe here, it'll automatically just be the constant type. Uh, but by default, you usually want smooth and free because these are the ones that you work with most. Uh, there's a separate one for integers, because integers you usually don't want them to smoothly go somewhere. For example, the um, material type, you don't want to have blank and sort of like 10 seconds later you want to have a, a jungle. You don't want it to go through all of them, you'll want to snap to it. That's why the default for it is constant. But if you need it to be, need it to be free or linear, you can have it that way. Then we have smooth scrolling, which uh, you already saw if I zoom or scale or whatever, it, it's nice and smooth. But if you don't like it, I know some people don't, you can turn it off, then it's just instant. 
and draw curve loops uh, refers to this display. It just shows you how this would repeat since it is looping. If you turn off looping, it won't show this because it's unnecessary. But uh, if you want to make something perfectly loop, you'll see, okay, this, this shouldn't be. So you can see it just updates it here and then try to align together. But if you don't want, to want this at all, even in loop mode, you can turn it off like this. Okay, now let's try something a little more complicated. So let's try actually animating a pose. Let's just select Maya and create a custom poser so that we can animate all of these controls. Now let's go to the animation sequence, open it up. And uh, of course it'll be annoying if we need to add them all one by one. So what we can do is just select all of them and click on object, which will add a track for every one of them. Now. Same thing, we could say, well, now I need to add all of these individually, but um, that's what this button is for. So you select all of the ones you want to add it to, click on this, and then we'll say for all of them, we want to add position and rotation. There we go. Let's just go to back to track view. All of the tracks have gotten a default position again. So we can start animating or just creating something for now. Let's just go to the end of the animation. Just change a few things like move her down a little, Maybe, um, let me just quickly do this. Um, maybe take her arms out a little and bow down a little or rotate her head to the left. Um, and now we also don't want to click these everywhere just to update the animation, but there's a global um, keyframe adder which will create it on every single object here. So let's just click that and then we can see just get this out of the way a little. You can see that she will blend between those two values. And using this principle, you can technically animate anything you want. Now, the only thing I haven't really talked about yet in the animation editor is event tracks. So if we click on here, we'll have this new object track, except it's just for events. And there's two different ways we can add event tracks. There's uh, event tracks that change a value every single frame. And there's notify tracks, how we call them, um, that just execute a specific event at a specific time. So let's try both. So the first one is I have this cube here. It has a set option value called uh, set cube value. So let's add set cube value in here. Um, and the type, you need to specify which type you want to have it because um, it doesn't know what these what, what the event is trying to change. So in this case, let's just also change the color again. So we want a color type. And the option we want to change is this color. So we'll also call it color. Add event track. And just as before, um, these will change the cube's color. So if I do this it should be green if I go over here and change it to red it'll go to red now you could say but why didn't you just add it as a normal object track and change the color um, you can but the added benefit of this is I could duplicate it a few times and all of them will receive that event so you only need one track to update all of them and the notify tracks if we want to add one of those, this name doesn't matter for the event itself. That's just how it uh, gets displayed here. So we can call it whatever we want. So let's just call it visible, for example, and add the notified track. Um, you can see it didn't add a default keyframe here because it doesn't know what you want it to do. So let's take this. This has an event sphere visibility and let's just add a keyframe here and click on it and then you can see time 0 0.5 that's where it is and then the value is the event we want to dispatch so let's say sphere visibility false now as soon as that gets crossed it's um, the visibility gets set to false let's add another one and also call this one sphere visibility and say true um, so it gets false and true false true so these only trigger once at that specific location Anyway, that about does it for this brief introduction to the animation editor. I hope I could explain everything that exists and that it wasn't too hard to follow. And well, yeah, have fun animating.